Okay, hello and welcome um, to the Bonalytics Live Facebook Live to explain our newest study. My name is Bjorn. I'm the research liaison here at Bonalytics, and we're joined today by Zach, the lead researcher on our new paper. It's called Domination and Exploitation, Understanding Industry Costs for Chicken, Egg, and Fish Products in the United States, Brazil, and China. So it's quite a lengthy report. Um, hi, Zach. Can you just tell us a little bit in summary what this report is about? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a report that, like you said, uh, it covers covers a lot of ground. And the angle it takes is a little bit different from a lot of animal advocacy research. So instead of looking at consumers and how to change their preferences, this report takes a look at the animal agriculture industry itself to try and understand what motivates the industry to, to function the way that it does. Um, and I don't, I don't think this will come as a shock to most people, but the big motivation for the animal ag industry is money. So a major thread that runs through this report is how the industry tries to make money and keep its costs down so that it can make as much money as possible. Uh, and I think that's really important information for advocates to know, because if you want to change the animal agriculture industry, you have to understand how and why it works the way that it does and, and what it might look like in the future. Okay. So... It, like you mentioned, it is a very long paper. If an animal advocate is trying to make sense of this and incorporate this research into their advocacy, how should they start? Where should they try and incorporate this? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a few ways that that they can approach it. Um, so first, as with, with all of the reports that Faunalytics puts out, which you can find at our website, faunalytics.org, we have two sections at the beginning of the report that give the main takeaways, right? We've got our key findings section, which summarizes sort of the big learnings in the report, kind of like a like a preview or a, a too long didn't read type explanation. And then we've got our recommendations section, which gives some suggestions we have based on what we learned doing this research. And in this report, we've got several recommendations specifically for advocates, and then also another handful of, of recommendations specifically for researchers. Uh, and then if advocates want to dive into the report more deeply, which I would recommend, they can navigate to the section that might be most useful to them. So this report is organized first by country and then within that by industry. We looked at the three biggest countries in terms of the production of uh, chicken, egg and aquaculture products. And those were the United States, Brazil and China. So if you're an advocate who's working in one of those regions, there's a whole section of the report dedicated to your country. And then within each of those sections, we dive into the details of the broiler chicken industry, the layer hen and egg industry and the aquaculture industry. And then how those work, what policies governments use to sort of prop them up uh, and what the future of those industries could look like in terms of threats to their business or technological developments. Okay. So I know there's a lot of ground to cover, but in general, if you can, can you try to tell us what the industry is like, the animal agriculture industry? How is it structured in general? Yeah. So I don't know if this is super unique to the animal agriculture industry itself, but like not and not every industry is like this, but it's definitely important to to recognize for the animal agriculture industry. Basically, there's a small number of really large corporations that dominate the agriculture, the animal agriculture industry. Um, and to say it a little differently, the industry is really consolidated. So I'm, I'm oversimplifying here a little bit, but an industry is consolidated when there's only a handful of companies that control a market. So for example, in the US broiler chicken industry, the top 10 biggest companies supply something like 80% of the chicken products purchased in the U.S. And those are companies like Tyson, Pilgrim's Pride, Sanderson Farms. Um, those three companies alone actually produce almost half of the chicken products in the U.S. So we're often, we're really only talking about a few companies when we say the chicken industry or the egg industry or something like that. So yeah, it's really, it's really consolidated, really only a few very large companies that, that are dominating the industry. And how do these companies get to be so big and powerful in the industries? Yeah, so there's there's a lot of factors. It's it's a long answer um, to give like all of all of the sort of different factors that contributed, but uh, and we cover a lot of those in the report. So I'm I'm just going to touch on on a couple of the biggest factors, and one of those biggest factors is is what's called vertical integration, which is kind of the fancy economic term to describe something that isn't actually too complicated. Um, so 
Uh, I'm going to give an example kind of to, to describe what that is. So say I'm a company that roasts coffee beans. If I buy another company that also roasts coffee beans, that's called horizontal uh, horizontal integration. And it's horizontal because it's at the same part of the supply process. We're both roasting beans. But if I then start buying the companies that do things earlier in the process, like the farms that grow the coffee beans, or if I acquire a company that does stuff later in the process, like brewing coffee or selling lattes, that's vertical integration. It's putting many of the steps of the production process under one roof, so to speak. So, okay, this report isn't talking about coffee, it's talking about animal products. So I'll give an example with Tyson, the massive US chicken company, right? Tyson owns not only the chickens, the processing plants and the distribution network, but also virtually every other step in the chain. So they own the mills that process raw grain into feed for chickens. That feed is then given to breeder chickens that come from a genetics company that Tyson also owns. And that feed is also given to chicks in Tyson owned hatcheries. When the chickens are large enough for slaughter, Tyson owned trucks transport the chickens to Tyson owned slaughterhouses before Tyson owned facilities turn the slaughtered chickens into products like chicken nuggets that are then packaged and shipped by workers employed by Tyson. So being in charge of all of those steps gives them a lot more control, certainty, efficiency in their business. Um, they don't have to worry about separate companies all trying to make their, their own profit along the way. It makes them much bigger and much more effective at creating animal products and, and obviously then creating uh, animal suffering too. And then on top of vertical integration, there's also factors like uh, indirect support from governments through subsidies to the animal feed industry, also mergers and acquisitions. And, you know, it's, it's gotten to a point where many of the brands that consumers see in a store are all owned by one company. So if you're in the grocery store and you see products that say, Jimmy Dean, Hillshire Farm, Ballpark, a lot of Sara Lee products. Those are all brands that are owned by Tyson. Um, and and that's, that's just within the U.S. Okay, so there's a lot of ver vertical integration, horizontal integration, um, and subsidies in the U.S. Is this the same thing that we're seeing in other countries as well? I know that you looked at China and Brazil. Yeah, so we, when we kind of talk, when we talk about these companies, we kind of talk about them like they operate in silos, right? Like there's this one country that does this terrible thing or one company that does that terrible thing or one country that, you know, it's really actually a super tangled web that kind of covers the whole world. Um, so for example, uh, Pilgrim's Pride is a massive company. It's the second largest producer of chicken products in the United States, uh, but it's actually owned by an even bigger corporation the world's largest meat company, actually JBS, which is a Brazilian company, right? So in the same way that Tyson kind of owns all these other brands, even the big companies in the U.S. might actually be owned by uh, a company from Brazil. Um, and it's the case across the whole industry. JBS doesn't just own Pilgrim's Pride. They have operations in different countries all around the world. So does Tyson. So do a lot of other animal ag companies. So is that why you decided to investigate so many different types of countries because they're so interconnected? Yeah, so that's a really good question. When we, when we began this project, we knew that these industries were present around the world and, and connected with each other, but it was actually surprising to me at least just, just how interconnected and globalized these industries really are. Um, we actually started by looking at some of the countries that slaughter the most chickens and fishes and produce the most products from those animals. Um, and, and you can look into those numbers and, and you see the same few countries again and again, the US, Brazil, and China. And it's not only in terms of production. I mean, you see these companies come up with imports and exports as well. So for example, China is one of the biggest producers of eggs in the world. It's also one of the biggest importers of chicken products. And the US and Brazil slaughter the most chickens in the world, a lot of which get eaten in those countries, but many also get exported to countries like China. Uh, a lot of US fish products come from China. So all of these countries are sort of interconnected when it comes to animal agriculture. And it's really, it's not even just the animal products themselves. Animal feed works the same way uh, with this kind of global web that's in a, a sort of like symbiotic relationship with the meat and egg and dairy industries. Yeah, the animal feed part is pretty interesting because I think it's one of the things people tend to ignore or at least not think about when we talk about industrial animal agriculture. Um, but when you were doing your report, you spent a lot of time investigating why feed is so critical. So, so tell us why is feed so critical? Like, why can we not ignore this component of the system? 
Yeah, it's actually animal feed is actually the single biggest cost for the industry, right? So when we think about like what is the industry spending its money on, it's largely animal feed. About two thirds, roughly, depends on the industry, depends on the company, but about two thirds of the animal ag industry's costs are animal feed. Um, the most common ingredients in that feed are soybeans and corn. Uh, and in fact, almost 80% of the soybeans that are grown around the world and more than half of the corn uh, are used for animal feed. Uh, and again, it's it's the US, Brazil, and China who consistently pop up when you look at the numbers for those feed crops. So um, the US is the biggest producer of corn in the world. It's also one of the biggest exporters of corn. So by doing that exporting, it's feeding the animal ag industry around the world. Brazil is one of the biggest soybean producers, and they export a lot of those soybeans to China, which uses them to feed animals like chickens and fishes. The U.S. then imports a lot of fish products from China, like I was mentioning earlier. So in other words, Brazilian soybeans are being used to feed Chinese fish that are ultimately eaten by U.S. consumers. So yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really global. So we've talked a lot about the, the chicken side of things and correspondingly the eggs. But you just mentioned the fishes and the aquaculture. So what does your report find about the aquaculture industry? Is it different than the others in any single way? Or is, it, um, is there anything that we as advocates should be paying attention to? Yeah, it's a really good question and an important one. For folks who don't know, fish products ultimately either come from sort of classic image you might have of, of boats in the ocean or a lake or something like that with, with nets. That's called wild caught or capture fishing. Um, they can also come from what are basically water-based factory farms or CAFOs in the form of aquaculture. Uh, even though aquaculture has been around for hundreds of years, the modern intensive aquaculture in industry itself is still, is still pretty young. Um, but it's growing and it's growing fast. In 2000, the year 2000, less than a third of fish products came from aquaculture, but today the majority of fish products in the world come from aquaculture. So in less than 25 years, there's been a, a huge shift. Um, and even though it's grown so much recently, the aquaculture industry is, it's still industrializing, it's still developing technology, it's still getting more efficient, it's still trying to maximize the number of fishes it can raise and, and slaughter for money. And there's a lot of support for that um, from governments and NGOs. Um, the broiler chicken industry, especially in the US and Brazil, have already gotten extremely efficient. Uh, they're basically giant machines that churn out chicken products and obviously also chicken suffering. Um, so my fear, and we talk about this in the report and give a lot of the background relevant to it, but my fear is that the aquaculture industry is on track to follow in the footsteps of the chicken industry and just get better and better at confining and slaughtering trillions really of fishes. Um, but because this is probably the direction that the aquaculture industry is headed in, advocates actually have a chance to try and outflank it and maybe put protections in place to try to limit the growth of aquaculture. And we talk about more uh, in the report what that might look like. But um, I think with industries like the chicken industry, um, the animal advocate sort of the, the animal advocacy movement wasn't that big when when the industry was sort of industrializing and we didn't necessarily know where it was headed. Um, and I think using the chicken industry as a, as a sort of blueprint, we know where the aquaculture industry is, is going to be sort of moving. And so we can, we have a chance to try to get around it and, and prevent some of that um, suffering from happening. It sounds like we're at a critical juncture with, yeah. with fishes. <laughs> Um, so what other takeaways do you think are really important to highlight that we haven't had a chance to talk about yet? Yeah, so I won't go into into too much detail on these, but just a few things that that we we do highlight in the report. Uh, we already touched on on this, but the the fight against uh, animal agriculture is is an antitrust fight. And by that, I mean that it might be possible to use existing antitrust legislation or create new legislation that works to limit the power of the industry. Uh, governments around the world have also subsidized the animal agriculture industry, some directly, others indirectly, but we cover we cover all that more in the report and talk about how advocates might be able to try to limit those funds or increase funding for plant-based agriculture. Uh, another thing that the report also covers is uh, a lot of the risks to the profits of the industry, including environmental policies in response to climate change, 
um, and the industry themselves are actually the source for a lot of these a lot of these risks. Um, and then we also highlight collaborative opportunities with advocates outside of the animal advocacy movement. And the report then also gets into some of the specifics of how these industries operate, whether it's you know the tournament system in the U.S. chicken industry or the impacts of animal feed farming in the Amazon and the Cerrado in Brazil, or the development of these sort of like greenwashed tanks for for fish in China. Okay, um, so I think we can open up to some questions uh, from the community. So we do have one from Egg Truth. How can we work together on a global scale to improve animal protection laws and promote a more compassionate approach to food production, keeping in mind the interconnectedness of our modern food systems? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question and, and thanks for asking. Um, I th one thing that sort of comes to mind immediately is I think we can often sort of feel like, or at least speaking for myself, like uh, maybe the country that I'm in, which is, is the US, is it's difficult for me to affect change in, in other countries. Um, and obviously it's, it's important to make sure that any sort of change that I'm trying to, to affect is you know, done in collaboration with, with groups that are located in those countries and that have the expertise of the place where they live. Um, but it's worth noting that that there are options sort of like, um, you know, uh, say the U.S. imports a lot of fish from China, like I, I was mentioning earlier. Um, if we in the U.S. as consumers pass a law that says that um, the the standards for fish products imported into the U.S. have to meet a certain uh, have to meet a certain standard, um, then that'll ultimately sort of trickle through to production in China and in order for them to continue exporting fish from China to the US, they'll have to sort of meet those standards. Um, so these, there's these sort of ways of talking to maybe groups who are in those countries to figure out what, um, what the conditions there are and then trying to figure out how we can affect those changes um, on the ground here. Okay. Um... Thank you so much, Zach. This is very interesting. And if anybody is listening and wants to learn more about this report, you can find it on our website and look for all of the details in there. Um, do you have anything else that you wanted to chat about or anything that you didn't think we covered today, Zach? No, I, I would just say that folks should check out the uh, check out the report on the website. Um, check out our other reports on, on our website as well. Um, and And yeah, if you have any questions about this report or about anything else related, to animal advocacy research, um, check out our, our virtual office hours. You can find them on our website, faunalytics.org. Um, and, and through those office hours, you can ask us any questions you might have or, or bounce any ideas you wanna bounce off of us. Um, yeah, whether they're related to this report or anything else, uh, or you can send us a, a direct message here on Facebook. Thanks for watching. Yeah. yeah, thank you everybody for attending and good luck with your advocacy.